Hi there, my name is Aaron Lanchman. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Georgia Tech, and this is the third part of a multi-part, somewhat informal series where I'm exploring both the Buchla 700 architecture, a very strange and extremely rare synthesizer from the brilliant mind of Don Buchla, and the programming language Super Collider that's well suited for music synthesis. So a couple of announcements, I suppose. One is a bunch of folks have asked if I've ever got around to actually posting the code, as I promised I would in the last couple of videos. This is my GitHub account. I'm new to GitHub, so I'm still figuring out my way around it. I will make zero guarantees that the code that you'll find here will match up with the code you'll find in the videos, but hopefully what's in the videos here will get you going. You're welcome to play around with this and do whatever with this you want. I dedicate this to the public domain. Although this has some quasi-tutorial aspects, I'm learning Super Collider myself. And as I go through the code, I'll talk about various things that I've discovered, particularly tricky spots. This isn't a detailed, well-thought-out set of videos in general, let alone a tutorial. If you're wanting something a little more specific, Eli Fieldsteel's YouTube page is an absolute gold mine. There's a set of tutorials that are somewhat systematic, and then there's also a set of live streams from the university class that he teaches. So definitely go check that out if you are new to Super Collider, or even if you've been using it for a while and want to learn some new tricks. I've made some new patches since the last time I did, uh, let's see, I guess it was part two. There's this little tubular bell patch. These are all adaptations from the DX7, this ROM bass here. So I have this little set of key pads, I guess. <laughs> They're not really set up to look like a piano because that was more effort than I would put in. But I can trigger sounds from either here or my MIDI controller, which you can't see. And let's see, that's ROM bass one, I think. I think that's the bass patch used in the Highway to the Danger Zone. Kenny Loggins song from, what was that from? I think that's Top Gun. Uh, here's another one. Bass sound. Oh, notice, it sounds a little brighter here because these pads default to full velocity. Whereas if I'm using the controller, I can have some velocity sensitivity. I'll talk about this in a little more detail a little bit later. There's this global variable velocity that I wind up setting that you can use in these various envelope bits of code that you can set here. So you can use velocity information. You could also use some pitch information. We'll talk about that in a bit. As I mentioned, this is the third part of a sequence. In the first part, I just sort of gave the general setup. And the second part, I went, I think, through the algorithms in a bit more detail and particularly focused on the synth def that runs on the server side. So Super Collider has a client-server architecture. That doesn't mean these are on different machines, although you could probably set it up that way, I guess. The actual code that generates the audio, that runs on the server software, and that's what's defined in the synth def. And then the rest of the code runs on the client side. And that's important to keep track of because there's a lot of coding structures like, say, if statements or switch statement kind of things that you can use on the client side code, say, that decides what notes to play next, but will not work on server side synthesis code. And that can be a very frustrating distinction when you first run across it. Here in the third video, I would like to dig into how we handle MIDI. We'll talk about the parts of the code that actually run this synth definition. And then in part four, we'll probably look at the GUI. So there's a few things in common here. I can make notes sound both from the GUI and from the keyboard, but I'll try to leave most of the GUI discussion for the next time. 
all of this stuff here is GUI code. Oh, one other thing is I'm running all of this code here in a block. So this parenthesis here starts a block of code you can execute, and this one parenthesis here ends a block of code. Notice it's the whole file. So instead of using evaluate file, as I think I have in the past when I introduced this, I'm using the cloverleaf or whatever the equivalent key if you're running Windows return to evaluate this region. So that open and close paren defines a block of code in this region. I execute it and that's what brings this up. The first time you run this code, I have a bug somewhere that I haven't bothered to track down where it comes up with this initial patch, but the first time you run it, that won't actually make it sound. You have to actually go in, select a patch to start the sound. Just that initial thing, no sound comes out. I haven't figured out why. I'll look at that another time probably. So let's go back to the various bits of code that handle MIDI. Ah, so this is the end of the code that defines the synth def, or I guess defines the synth. Synth def stands for synth definition. Like if you say ATM machines, you're really saying automatic teller machine machines. Or if you say BJT transistors, you're saying bipolar junction transistor transistors. Anyway, okay, back on topic. Here we are starting up our MIDI services of what various of various sorts. Way this is structured, the way I set up an array here for all of your MIDI notes, that's probably not the most efficient way to do this, but memory is cheap, and so might as well. The overall structure here I got from Eli Fieldsteel's tutorials about how to handle MIDI, so definitely go check that out. Here I'm defining a function called start note. This is a global variable, start note. So global variables all start with this. Well, they don't all start. There's an exception I'll mention later. They generally start with a tilde. And that's nice because you get the syntax highlighting and super collider. And functions are defined by these open and closed parens. So I've mentioned this on a few other occasions, but the various curly brackets you see in Super Collider, those are not generic code blocks like you would find in JavaScript or C or any of the C whatever languages. These open and closed curly brackets very specifically define functions. And functions in Super Collider are what CS people would call first class objects. You can assign them to variables. So you don't have a separate set up like def, blah, 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 whatever, to define a function like you would in something like Python. So the arguments that this function will take are called velocity and note number. I is actually I take these and I assign them in a certain way. I take the velocity, uh, the MIDI velocities will go from 0 to 127. So I divide by 127 to make that 0 to 1. And I set that to this global variable velocity just I call it vel. That way I can use it in various patches. So in this this electric piano patch I can use it for touch sensitivity there. Velocity sensitivity. Similarly, I don't know if I have any patches that use this, but I do have the ability to change what things are doing based on the note number. Say so I don't use it. Do I use that in any of these patches? I don't think so. I, I did some experiments just to make sure it actually worked. There is a note number here, this tilde NN that you could use in one of these envelope statements. I guess on the DX series of instruments, the Yamaha instruments this is called keyboard scaling, I think. And fasten your seatbelts because this is one of the weirdest, trickiest parts of the code. There's probably a clearer, better way to do this, but this is what I came up with. I didn't want to have to have a whole bunch of different fields in here for all of the various envelope types. The Buchla 700 and pretty much all the Buchla instruments have envelope looping capabilities. I think he called them things like function generators. That would be a very Don Buchla thing to do that were far beyond your standard attack, decay, sustain, release. I got the idea to take bits of code that you could just type here into the GUI 
and execute those to define the various envelopes. So these are actually lines of code that you could actually put into a super collider program. So the way we handle this is I have this global variable. The G here is sort of my additional thing for keeping track of global variables. If I have a similarly named local variable, I put the G in front. This is not a standard super collider style and it's probably bad programming practice in general, but whatever. So this do method is run on this variable G environment strings. This has been previously assigned to be an array. And what do lets you do is loop through the elements of that array. And the way it handles that is you give it a function. So here we're passing as a parameter to this method do, we're passing in a function, we're defining that takes two variables, item and I. Essentially what do does is it will loop through your array one by one, calling this function, assigning each item in the array in sequence to item. And as it's looping through, it will also keep indexing this number I. Essentially what we wind up doing here is this string contains all of the various envelope strings defining bits of code that you see in here. It takes that text that's assigned elsewhere in the GUI code, which we'll look at in part four. It's going to take the particular item out of the array. So it goes through these doot, 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 running through all of these. And here's a weird little trick that I do here using try facilities. So this is an error handling ability that's built into Super Collider because the main thing I wanted to have happen is that if this is garbage code, I don't want to execute the code and then have it turn out that it just crashes the whole program. When we use the dot compile method on the string, it tries to compile that string as if it had been a piece of code sitting here in this program. If it runs into trouble with that, then the code won't produce a proper envelope. But at least the setup here means that the program doesn't crash and complain if the code doesn't actually compile. If it compiles to an envelope, that's where this is kind of envelope method comes into play here. We check to see if an actual envelope was created by trying to compile this piece of code. If it does, we assign it to the array of envelopes we have. Remember, the thing out here is just a text string defining it. Here it's actually trying to compile it and turn it to an envelope. I'll come back to some of the structure of this if statement in a second. If that worked okay, then we'll take the string color here and set it to green, this IDX1 or IDX2. That string color is referring to the titles. So someplace else I set up an array of the titles of the various envelopes like IDX1, IDX2, all the way up through, you know, level B, filter, cutoff, resonance, et cetera, et cetera. If I type garbage in here, aha, notice it complained. There's a parse failed. The code's still running, but let me take that back out. See, it turned to red because it complained. And then I hit return. Then it turned back to green. Actually, come to think of it, this may be the result of some cutting and paste programming. This is a thing that's run each time you actually try to start a note. I may not actually need all this code here. I'd have to go back and think about it because I think this is cut and paste from somewhere else. This looks like a debugging. I don't know why I use the word charm here. I probably should have looked at this code a bit more before starting this. Anyway, I hope this is still useful. So some of the things I'm describing here may happen on another occasion elsewhere in the code. Let's talk a little bit about the if statements, the way that's set up in Super Collider. If you think about your standard way of what I'm typing here is not, <laughs> not real super collider code. You know, say if A is bigger than three, then I don't know, B is equal to four, else C is equal to three or whatever. So that's your typical statement of if then in another language, right? Not super collider. This has to be a special form in most languages because you want these bits of pieces of code to only execute in certain 
situations, depending on obviously how this wound up. You couldn't actually declare a function, say, you know, if condition, then part, else part, and then write a piece of code, you know, define however you define functions in your language, whatever it may be. Because your usual function call protocols say that all of your input parameters need to be fully evaluated. The way if works is that the then part and the else part both have to be wrapped in curly braces that define a function. By the fact that they're wrapped in curly braces, it creates a function that function doesn't actually get executed. So then the if statement here can evaluate this condition, find if it's true or false, and then ask for the value of e either of these functions, depending on whether it was true or false. And it's important that it be wrapped in functions like that in order for that to work. In fact, let's see if this works. Is true defined? Let's see. Should be. So I'm going to ask it about true. I'm going to use shift enter. Ah, so what is true? It's true. What is false? It's false. All right, so let's see. If I do if, ah, we can. So I'll say something here like, let's just output the number three. That's going to be the result of this function. Otherwise, it's going to be five. So true is true. So if we evaluate that, we'll get three. Let's ask the same thing of false. Let's do it like that. So notice the weird syntax here. So really, if we are doing if A, B, C in Super Collider, what that really is, that's just syntactic sugar. And pretty much all of the various object message sends in Super Collider can be structured like this. What you're really doing here is you're taking A, the object A, which hopefully is a true or false, a Boolean, and then you're passing an if message to it with the parameters B and C. That's what's really going on. This is very small talk. This is how if statements in small talk work. True and false are things defined in small talk. They're objects that when you give them an if method will do certain things with the arguments to the if method. That's why you have to have the curly brackets here because that's what's really going on in an if statement. The same thing with a bunch of other structures. Super Collider and like the small talk that inspired it tries to avoid having special forms in its semantics. It really wants everything to act like objects being sent messages, possibly with parameters. Why did I use the word charm here? That was, sometimes I'll have random words for debugging. I don't need that anymore, whatever it is. What does defer do? I'll have to think about that. Just a second, I'll be right back. Okay, so I looked this up. Defer, delay, evaluation of the function by delta in seconds on app clock. That's weird. What was I doing here? Why do I need to use defer? I honestly don't remember why I needed to put that defer there. I probably had something that wasn't working, searched on the web to try to find people running into similar problems and found that putting dot defer there was the right thing to do. Sorry, I don't remember why I had to put that there. It looks like there's some timing issue about when things were updated. I think I do need to have this code here, maybe not so much the error checking code, because if you're at the point of actually being able to play notes, then it should already have gone through some checks like this in the GUI. But I do need to do some of the evaluations here because you want to be able to use this note number and velocity information when you execute the code that creates the envelopes. At least this part where you compile it needs to be there. And when I was doing this, I probably thought it was easiest just to copy the structure from the GUI code that checks for problems. Maybe it's a good idea to have it there in case something slipped through somehow. I don't know. That was a lot on what? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten lines of code, and a couple of them are mostly empty. This is one of the most complicated parts of the code. So now that we have all that set up, we'll actually use the synth class and run a method on it called new and actually create an instance of the synth class to make the sound. So each time I 
Play with that here. Each of those notes creates a new instance of this synth that runs. And what is it? It's the FBFM. So this is defined by a symbol, which in Super Collider you indicate by this backslash. It creates it and then it assigns it to this array for the note number. And this is how we sort of can easily handle polyphony. Again, this is from Eli Fieldsteel's tutorials. The synth, the slash FBFM, what does that refer to? That refers to this slash FBFM up here in the synth def. Now, we have a whole bunch of arguments in here that I have defined some default values for, but usually you want to override these. So here we have freak, gate, config, offsets, numerators, yada, yada, yada. So if we go down and look at where we actually run a particular instance, the structure for that is you take the variable name, but you turn it into a symbol. So the variable name in the argument, you need to put a slash in front of it to turn it into a symbol, and then you give it whatever you want to sign. So instead of saying blah, blah, blah equals in here, you'll see symbol, some value, symbol, value, symbol, value, symbol, value. And this is one of the reasons I use G a lot. So this G config, G offsets, G numerators, those stand for global. Again, this is not a super collider convention. This is something I did to differentiate it from the slash numerator, slash denominator, slash CF, et cetera, et cetera. I would have loved to actually pass in the entire array of envelopes. It seemed to not want me to do that. That's why I have envelope one, envelope two, envelope three, envelope four, envelope five are all separately passed in. The index one eno, level A eno, these are defined elsewhere in the code. They're just numbers that index into the appropriate place in this array of envelopes, you know, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, et cetera. Super Collider does start numbering things from zero, but the Buchla docs started indexes at one. There's a one-off thing going on here. So that isn't as elegant as I might want it to be, but it worked. So then what's the last thing we do in the start note function? Well, we take the synth instance that we've created that's now running and we register it. And this registering allows us to change various parameters on the fly and do stuff with the synth while it's running. Okay, so that's a function that knows how to start a note playing. We also need to stop notes playing. Notes start and end in terms of their envelopes according to this gate argument. We'll set gate one to start the note and start its envelopes off. And the only thing we're really doing here in stop note is we're setting that to zero to put all of the envelopes into their release cycle. And then once we've done that, we also remove that from the set of synths that are playing by setting that to nil. And this essentially opens it back up so you can play another note at the same pitch. Notice that this was just a function that we've been talking about so far. We haven't actually done anything with the MIDI. So that's where this MIDI def comes in. So here we can define a way to handle note on commands and note off commands. These are various things that you can look up what they do. So here's the note on test and note off test. They'll define various variables for you, like the MIDI channel, source, whatever that is. I have to maybe go back and look that up. Don't remember. Don't use it here. So notice all we're doing here is if the MIDI setup gets a note on or a note off command, we just run our functions according to whatever velocity or note number we get. The dot value here, that's a method that functions know how to respond to. And the parameters you give to that value method are the parameters you pass to the function. Usually in, in most programming languages, you would define a function, x, y, and whatever. And when you would call it, you do something like that. Here we're doing f dot value, whatever we're passing in for x and y. That's just the way Super Collider works. Also notice that one of the arguments that the note on message takes itself is a function. Now, part of our contract is that this setup of the note on will pass in the velocity and the note number, the channel, et cetera, into the arguments of this function. You really need to get used to just using functions all over the place in Super Collider. 
So I think that's it as far as the MIDI code goes. We also have a way to use the start note command from the from the GUI. And if I scroll ahead a little bit, just as a bit of a preview for the GUI code, that starts here. Let's see. Going through the GUI code. Ah, yeah, I looked up error earlier. You'll see similar structures to what I just showed you. Things that handle, say, the envelopes here. Here's the GUI code that will handle it. You'll see that try structure, and you'll see the code that sets things to green or red, depending on if one of these has an error in it or not. I think the actual errors and the evaluation of the envelope code happen here. I'm setting the envelopes here, and I'm also setting them in the start note code. I think I do have to do that here anyway, because I might have to use whatever the new velocity is. And I definitely have to at least try compiling the code here to see if it's an error to know to flag that in the GUI. Now in the start note code, I might be able to assume that errors have already been trapped and the color has been set correctly. So I may be able to strip some of that out, but I would still need to, I think, evaluate the string in order to be able to use whatever the current velocity or note number information is. I'm not sure. There may be some redundancies here. You could probably do a lot to clean up this code. Anyway, in the next part, part four, we'll look at the GUI code that creates all this neat stuff over here. All right, talk to you later.